thank you. And Andy, I hope you don't mind me doctoring the, the title in terms of saying, you know, I think we're clearly, you're all pretty brilliant at imagining what an economy might look like that's better than the one we've got today. But I, so I think the exciting, oh, the exciting task is, um, I'm just going to go back, is, is actually rolling up our sleeves and exploring how we, how we build it. And I have to say, though, it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge honour to be here. The, the morning's discussions have been so rich and so pointed and so focused. And I'm very, very excited to see what comes out of these discussions. And we'll be there in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance cheering you on and doing everything we can to amplify the messages and the ideas and the practice that come, comes out from these discussions. Um, I wanted, though, ask you to think really macro. Uh, think, think global, sort of cast your mind to sort of where we are halfway through 2019 uh, across the world. And I want to check if you agree with something that Barack Obama said a couple of years ago. He was talking to a group of White House interns and he said to them, today is the best day to be alive. He said, you're more likely to be healthy, you're more likely to be educated and you're more likely to have the freedom to choose to live the life you want to live than ever before. So put up your hand if you're with Barrack. If you think, you know, we have progressed and we're at a good place now. Oh, this is so interesting. I asked the same question at um, a whole lot of German government officials a couple of, couple of weeks ago, and they all went, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it's great. Uh, and I guess I think one of the key things, if you look across the world, it's hard to deny that there has been a huge amount of progress in the last few decades and we've seen you know great progress in terms of health developments in terms of life expectancy uh, literacy falling you could add to that things like the expansion of democracy women entering politics in the workplace perhaps even better food maybe even better music though if you look at my playlist you desperately disagree with that and and you know everyone could point to and an element of progress that they think, yeah, you know, so there has been, you know, the arc of improvement it has been significant. And so often, though, these sorts of achievements have happened not just on the back of growth in and of itself, but when growth has been very concertedly and deliberately channeled in a way that it has been pro-poor and that it's been used to build our collective institutions things like uh, public health systems and public education systems. And the challenge is, though, that if we look around the world, it is very clear that it is time to ask another question. Are those fruits of growth beginning to rot? And we see that if we turn the pages of our newspapers and see the warnings from scientists getting more and more stark, whether it's the IPPC's work around the now 11 years that we have to make the transformation in the economy to keep below 1.5 degrees, or just recently, whether it's a global assessment on biodiversity with scientists warning of the sixth mass extinction, and pointing the finger very squarely at the economic growth model as the, the culprit for the pressure that humans are putting on the planet. And so we're now entering this new era that Earth system scientists are talking about, and they're calling it the Anthropocene, because it is now human beings who are the dominant force changing the way the Earth operates and what's happening on the planet. But if you look a bit more thoughtfully, you say it's not all humans. It is a very select group of some of the, the richest people. And, and I want to, wanted to share with you some research that was done by my old colleagues at Oxfam a couple of years ago. This was ahead of the Paris COP negotiations in 2015. And what they did is they looked at people's CO2 emissions by lifestyle. So not that which is offshored and then counted in another country's carbon ledger, but those which your consumption is responsible for. And rather ironically, it's a champagne glass. And you can see here that, you know, we've got income deciles. It's the top 10% of people, in, term, in richest people, wherever they are in the world, who are responsible for almost half of the world's CO2 emissions. Remember this any time someone talks about population being the problem. But equally, while there is huge inequality 
in terms of who it is who's putting pressure on the planet. There's also huge inequality in terms of the, who is capturing those economic resources as well. And we've got a, an economic system now that, I mean, people, and I've heard it again today, using the phrase, the economic system is broken. It's not. The economic system is doing exactly what it is designed to do. And it is designed to siphon wealth upwards. And we've got a situation in last year, 85% of all the wealth, wealth that was created went to the top 1%, and the poorest half of the world's population got nothing. The Global Inequality Report, which is Thomas Piketty and over 100 scholars looking at economic inequality, say that seven out of 10 of us live in countries where economic inequality is rising. And there's a lot of public health officials in the room here. You will know that this, and we've heard so powerfully from Imogen this morning, this is a matter of life and death. Has anyone seen this map? This is a Glasgow train system. And it's created by a good friend of mine, Jerry McCartney, who works for Public Health Scotland. And you can see that if you get on the train at the you know, Jordan Hill Highland area, this is where I live. And if I was feeling really energetic in the morning and I went for a run, I could run to the other side of the city. It's not far. We're talking a matter of miles. But for every train stop that you tr go from the west to the east of Glasgow, men living in that area lose life expectancy of two years. And to the extent you're talking about a gap of 14 years, it gets worse if you go even further west. And so this is quite literally an economic system that is killing people. And part of the problem is that we've purposed the economy in a way that doesn't attend sufficiently to what people and planet really, really need. We've got a profound misalignment between what the economy is geared up to do and what humans really need out of the economy. Francis Moore Lappy says, why is it that we are crea collectively creating a world that none of us as individuals actually want? And that has a question about our democracy and our political system. So I'm so thrilled you're attending to this in a couple of weeks. But it's very much about how we have designed and purposed the economy. So it's one that's putting pressure on the planet. It's an unevenly shared harvest. And it's also an economic system and a model of growth and extraction that is putting such pressure on individuals. And we've heard that so powerfully this morning in terms of rising levels of loneliness, of distress, of time scarcity, rising levels of self-harm amongst young people, people feeling that their lives are so precarious that they have no control. And we see people turning to the pillbox for short-term coping mechanisms. They're reaching out, they're realizing that they're not on steady ground, that this economy is alienating and precarious, and they're reaching out for coping mechanisms at the pillbox, but also, as we've already discussed this morning, when that sense of precariousness leads to othering, we're also seeing people turn to coping mechanisms at, or supposed coping mechanisms at the ballot box. And so this is where we're at. We've got this strange economy that is not delivering on either front, not delivering for people and planet. And I, and I want to share with you this beautiful poem that I came across recently called The Paradox of Our Age. And it says, we've got bigger houses but smaller families, more conveniences but less time, more degrees but less sense, more knowledge but less judgment, more experts but more problems, more medicines but less healthiness. We've been all the way to the moon and back but have trouble crossing the street to meet our neighbour. We build more computers to hold more copies than ever before but has, have less real communication. We've become long on quantity but short on quality. These are times of fast food, but slow digestion. Tall men, and we can all name a few, but short characters, steep profits, but shallow relationships. It's this extraordinary time we find ourselves, this huge misalignment between what I think everyone in this room would say is most important and the products of the political and economic system. And in getting my head around it, and this is sort of stuff I wrote about in a very yellow book, um, that came out in, in January. There are three concepts that I, we've, my co-author Jeremy and I found useful. 
and I'll talk you through them briefly. One is this idea of diminishing marginal returns. The next is this idea that we've got failure demand, defensive expenditure, consolation goods that add up to uneconomic growth. And then the final one is the extent to which we're reaching for pseudo-satisfiers. And so diminishing marginal returns, if anyone studied economics, you would have learned this in your first semester in Economics 101. You've equally, if you've stood at a cheese shop and enjoyed the first and the second or the third bites of cheese more than you've enjoyed the 21st or the 22nd or 23rd bite of cheese, this idea of diminishing marginal returns will be familiar to you. And so it is with our economic system. We essentially, at the beginning stages of economic growth, whether it's for a country or for an individual or community, more growth really matters. But very quickly, those benefits start to tail off. We get diminished bang for our buck. And there are two different ways of looking at it here that I want to share with you. This one here is something called the Genuine Progress Indicator. And that's been tallied up for the world in the post-war era. And you can see that since in you know, the first few decades of the post-war era, this is a global age of capitalism, supposedly, when we built those collective institutions, you can see that GDP per capita and genuine progress were rising fairly similar. And genuine progress takes in a whole wide range of things like inequality, uh, people's commuting, uh, access to green space, volunteering, a whole ton of things. If you want more information, ask, ask me later. But since 1978, and we can have a discussion later about what happened in 1978 and the years subsequently, Genuine progress flatlined, whereas GDP per capita largely carried on merrily upwards. And the gap between GDP, our main measure of how the economy is doing, and even our main measure of national success, kept going up. And the gap just got worse and worse. The other, another way of looking at it is by something called the social progress index. And what they've got on the y-axis is 52 different dimensions of social progress. Things like access to education, freedom of speech, uh, protection of the environment, early years, development, and so on. Whole different suite of fairly intuitive measures of social progress. And then they've mapped along the x-axis different countries according to their GDP per capita. And again, you can see early stages of economic development, more growth really matters. You get very steep returns in terms of social progress, but very quickly those returns start to tail off. I'll come back to that. Just one example. You can see Costa Rica here and South Korea here, almost identical levels of social progress, but a difference in GDP per capita of almost 20,000 US dollars. And you could replace along the bottom GDP per capita with impact on the planet, ecological footprint or biodiversity loss or carbon emissions, and you would get a very, very similar picture. And so the second concept is this idea of failure demand. Um, and Spencer from the Scottish Government will be familiar with this because this is something that the Scottish Government has grappled with in a report a couple of years ago. It's essentially reactive expenditure that is necessitated by our failure to help people live good lives. And it, to me, it's summed up by these two signs that I saw next to each other in a Glasgow street a few months ago, essentially we're doing so much harm to ourselves, we're then having to spend a ton of money to fix it. Um, you know, one example in Scotland, it's been estimated that at least 40% of what local authorities spend is driven by the extent of inequalities, the failure in our economic system to help people live good lives. And we could think about, you know, it's a bit like an onion. Once you have this idea in your mind, you will see it everywhere. It's things like a lot of the accident and emergency expenditure, a lot of remedial education, in topping up people's wages for people who are on poverty wages, so in-work tax credits and so on, maybe housing benefits, a lot of the criminal justice system. You'll start to see it everywhere. And the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, for example, have estimated that almost 80 billion pounds every year is spent for the damage May, trying to make up for the way damage harms people, poverty harms people's lives. And we will all know just how rubbish <laughs> the, the impact in help, helping to support people. So we're spending all this money and we're not even doing the job very well in terms of supporting people. Equally, loneliness, which is, you could say is part of a reaction to the current alienating, precarious economic system, is costing the NHS and the police in the millions and billions of pounds. Another way of looking at it, is, to me, is really powerful. In the US, over 5 million workers are working in this idea of guard labor. So it's security guards working in the defense system, 
uh, members of police and the prison service and so on. It's essentially expenditure on workers in industries that reflect our failure to create good lives to people. And there is an environmental equivalent of that too, what ecological economists would call e uh, defensive expenditures. And again, like an onion, and you'll see it everywhere. It's like cleaning up after a flood or fixing the coastlines after an oil spill or the increased insurance if you live on a, on a floodplain or something that's very familiar to me, trying to build back a community after a bushfire has r raced through it. And there's also an individual component to that. And Sergei Latouche, who's a French political economist, he said there's a whole industry that is built up that is then going to sell to us things that help us console us for our stressed and alienating and precarious lives. I mean, and I'm the first one to admit that at the end of a stressful, busy week, I'm going to reach for the bottle of red wine. Or it's the pamper weekends marketed to women who are pushed to have it all. I mean, you can, again, you see this everywhere, this extent to which we're being pushed to sort of buy things to console ourselves for the sort of lives that are the best that we can hope for in this current economic system. And you bring that all together and you cannot help but thinking that while, and I'm not black and white on growth, clearly as I've said, growth really matters. But after a point, if we keep designing our economies for faster, faster GDP growth, we're going to pass this threshold point beyond which those benefits of growth start to tail off. And that's from Manfred Maxneef, who's one of my favorite economists, but Herman Daly, who used to work for the World Bank, he would say, mm, that idea of diminishing marginal returns that you were talking about earlier, that's actually quite benign. What we should, we should be thinking about is if you add all this defensive expenditure and failure demand together, actually we're in the territory of uneconomic growth, where so much of what we're spending is created by the harm and undone by things like inequality and the impact on the planet. And just the final concept is pseudo-satisfiers. The extent to which we are reaching to satisfy very innate, very human needs with things that are extrinsic. And I mean, we see this pedal to us, the extent to which we're told that getting more friends is as easy as opening a bottle of Coke. I mean, you see this everywhere. It's sort of this idea that in a way GDP in a macro sense has become a pseudo satisfier as well. We're told that it is the, you know, the means to the ends, but actually it's very, very bad at satisfying the ends of building good lives for people. So this young guy is my nephew. And if any of you have got someone in your life who's about you know, four or five years old, a grandson or a child or a niece or someone, and you'll hear the mofflings say, but why, but why, but why? We need to be like my nephew who's at that age. We need to not just be content to look at the symptoms of the economic system and wring our hands and yes, do that vital work of helping people cope with the current economic system. But we also need to ask, but why? What is going on upstream? And when you have that conversation, you so often come to the nature of the economic system. And the challenge is when we look around the world to find an economy that we can take ideas from or take leadership from, we reach a blank corner. What this chart shows is countries, we've already spoken about the, the donut. This country has mapped the world looking for countries and economies that get inside the donut that don't put undue pressure on the biophysical space on the world, but also lift their citizens above a social foundation. And this is, of course, in, in average terms. So what we see in the, this top corner here is the richest countries in an average sense, and we know it's deeply unequal within all of these countries, but on an average sense, they're lifting their citizens above a social foundation. But they're doing so while putting pretty high level pressure on the planet. There are other countries who are not putting much pressure on the planet, but they're also not yet able to lift their citizens above a social foundation. It leaves a blank space, which is really why your discussions are called imagining, because we need to allow ourselves to imagine and then build a different sort of economy. We've got now, as I th hope, <laughs> I hope it's pretty clear, an economic system that is not delivering the goods. It's not intelligent because it is wasting so much resources through failure demand and defensive expenditure and consolation goods. It's certainly not beautiful in terms of what the pressure it's putting on the planet. It's not just. 
in terms of the grave levels of inequality and the extent to which those who have already got wealth are siphoning it upwards to just build more wealth. And it's not delivering the goods. And this same person said, we dislike it and we're beginning to despise it. And I think we see that again with people, as I said, reaching for coping mechanisms at the pill box and at the ballot box. But when we come to think about what to put in its place, we're extremely perplexed. This was John Maynard Keynes writing almost 90 years ago. I think the good news is now that halfway through 2019, in rooms like this, we do know what to put in its place. We call it a well-being economy. I don't care what you call it. Call it a donut economy, it's regenerative economy, solidarity economy, it doesn't matter. What matters is that there are core commonalities across them. And you don't need to look far to see what a well-being economy is about. You can see it if you look at the pages of great development scholars like Manfred Max Neef or Amartya Sen and Martha Nesbaum. If you read the evidence from neuroscientists when they're looking at brain scans and telling what's, what makes us stressed or what makes us content when cortisol is rushing around through our brains when we're stressed and worried or when we're feeling happy, you see the same sort of messages. I'd say most importantly, you hear it when you sit down with people wherever they are in the world, whether it's in the slums of Delhi or the Amazon in Brazil or former shipbuilding communities in Glasgow and ask people, what is it that really matters to you? You hear very, very similar messages. This is what makes us innately human. And rather than me listing them, I want to share with you some findings from a palliative nurse who, over her years of work, spoke to people about what were their regrets in the, when they were in their last days. And it's things like, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings to stay in touch with my friends and let myself be happier. And so these are messages of relationships, of authenticity, and of work-life balance. And so you pull that all together and you say, okay, what does this mean for the economy? How do we bring back that alignment between what sort of economy can start to deliver on some of these ambitions rather than just faster, faster GDP growth or faster, faster quarterly profits? And for us, we, this is about what a well-being economy is about. And it's about collective well-being for people and for planet. It's not just on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you? It's about really collective, multi-dimensional well-being. It's about ensuring that everyone has their fundamental needs met, that resources are shared equally, whether economic resources, but also not letting that top 10% to continue to put undue pressure on the planet. And it's also about ensuring that no longer do we kowtow thinking the economy is the most important sphere of work, but we recognise that both society and the economy are embedded in nature and the economy is embedded in society. And even, even the UN is saying this. This is the UN recognising here. They, this is called the wedding cake chart. I can't quite get it. Clearly, I don't go to the right weddings. But it's essentially recognising that the economy is a subset of society and both of which are subset of our precious biosphere. And it's also about going back to saying we are no longer content to just stay on this middle panel, spending on our failure demand and defensive expenditure with all the political manoeuvring and all the struggle, because we know that people are not being sufficiently supported by the current offerings of helping to cope. It's not good enough, the situation we've got at the moment. So we have to be more ambitious than that. And so actually, can we build in economic justice into the system. So going beyond just fixing and healing and cleaning up to actually redistributing. And that word that hasn't cropped up yet, but almost it's been in the back of your minds, even if you don't know it or not, this really ugly word, but beautiful concept of pre-distribution. Essentially, can we get the economy to do more of the heavy lifting? Say that the economy needs to be much more part of the solution. So it's designed in a way that people have enough to live on and that people have enough to build good lives to people. And part of that is massively transforming how our businesses and economic actors operate. This chap here is Jack Welsh, who used to be former CEO of General Electric and reportedly coined the term shareholder value. He has now conceded that shareholder value is the dumbest idea in the world. And so we massively need to open up our imaginations about the sort of businesses 
that are not just pursuing short-term shareholder value for those who are wealthy enough to already own shares or to have pensions. And if you take a global perspective, if you're lucky enough to have a pension, you are in a very privileged cohort of people. It's also about massively repurposing what the economy and those businesses are about. So we're not just focusing on these narrow measures that are increasingly misaligned to what we really need, but cherishing and nurturing what really matters for us. It's about ensuring that the economy is no longer linear in that take waste um, take make waste linear model of old times with all its built-in planned obsolescence but actually it's circular and cherishing and regenerating even the environment being much more ambitious than just sustainability but going into the regenerative space it's of course got to be renewable this came out of Australia and I just think oh, come, come on Australians <laughs> they're suffering their worst drought ever and what do they do open a coal mine crikey um, and it's the good news is that there is so much of this already happening. We see around the world amazing examples of organisations, of businesses, of policymakers that are putting this into practice already. And I want to give you a hint of sort of the, the movement that you are part of and its long roots. And it stretches way back before this. But in terms of really thinking about the purpose of the economy, one of the most famous, famous political speeches, most poetic political speech has ever given was Robert Kennedy's speech in 1978, just a few months before he was assassinated. I, I'm really sick of hearing it repeated, so I'm not going to, but if you haven't heard it, look it up on YouTube and hear the actual, him actually speaking the lines, because it is just the most beautiful tirade against GDP that you're ever likely to hear. That same a couple of years later, uh, we had the Club of Rome publish the Limits to Growth report, but that same year, we had the king of Bhutan say that gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. Skip forward a ton of years, and then we had the global financial crisis. And you would have thought that would open up a big rethinking, open up our imaginations about a different economic system. And what we got instead was this sort of political mission to push down faster on the pedal of GDP. So just a year or so after that, we had this report from a commission by um, President Sarkozy of France with some of the world's greatest economists looking at the measure of progress and really pointing the finger at GDP as a problematic measure of our collective progress. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Clearly haven't nailed this slide. A couple of years later, we had the UN report on a better development paradigm. We then had the SDGs agreed a couple of years later in 2015 with all major countries in the world signing up for 17 different measures of progress. Now they're flawed, they're not perfect, but they do set a different course of what countries have said is important understanding of development in the 21st century. A couple of years later, just last year, we had over 200 academics writing to the EU and in a letter that went syndicated across newspapers across Europe saying instead of the EU's growth and stability pact, we need a well-being and stability pact. And then just a couple of months after that, there was an update of that 2009 report commissioned by the OECD with people like Joseph Stiglitz. And what it said was that in response to the financial crisis, Governments have too narrowly focused on increasing GDP and what that's led to, and that's led to the flawed measures of austerity that you've heard about, that's led to the financial insecurity. This is going to keep working. We've, of course, had my little organisation launched just last year and a group of wellbeing economy governments partnership, which I'll tell you about in a minute. We've had young people coming out on the streets, standing up for their futures, calling political administrations out for their intransigence in the face of all the science around our impact on the planet. And again, we've had more academics going back to the EU and saying get rid of what they call King GDP and Crown Queen wellbeing. And we're going to see more and more. So that's what's happening in the political sphere. There's a big head of steam around this. Not yet packing the punch we need it to, but there are examples. There is people turning their attention to this conversation. I'm going to race through this. We've also had amazing new business practices when I talk about sort of shareholder value and the linear model of manufacturing. We've got businesses around the world, I suspect loads of them here in Preston. One of your panellists earlier this morning, you were talking about the sort of cooperatives and social enterprises and so on. These are about businesses that are using the vehicle of commercial viability 
but with social, and this is Mondragon here that Matthew referenced, using the vehicle of commercial activities for a social and environmental purpose. We've also got this growing movement around participatory democracy. I once heard a beautiful phrase that local government budgets are moral statements with numbers attached to them. And so if we're going to take that seriously, then groups like this, meetings like this, need to be the forefront of deciding how local budgets are spent. We've got amazing examples of the circular economy. My favourite is one of these ones here. This is up on the island of Isla, where communities, just because they're local and they, they have the, the big picture, they have for years been using the waste heat from the Beaumont distillery to heat the local community swimming pool. It's those sort of obvious solutions that when communities are allowed to direct the direction of the economy, you get these sorts of really obvious solutions. It's also about sharing work better, ensuring that folks who are working way too much, either to keep their families above the breadline on three jobs, or because they're just wanting to service their debt or, or service their London mortgage apartment, learning from places like the Netherlands and Denmark in sharing work better so that those who don't have enough and are not paid enough have sufficient and those who've got too much and are taking shortcuts and are not part of their community and not part of their family have got less so they're able to engage in those when they don't have those regrets at their end of their days that we heard earlier wishing they hadn't worked so hard. It's also about for individuals recognising that once we've met a certain level of consumption more and more consumption can be a huge burden. And that it's about understanding that yes, a basic needs and for plenty of people, even here in the UK, the richest country in the world, people don't have basic needs net met. But we also need to understand for those of us who are lucky enough to have our basic needs met, more satisfaction and fulfillment won't come from ever perpetual life in consumption. It's going to be through experiences and community participation, coming to groups like this. And it's also about doing things like what the Welsh Government have done in enacting a Future Generations Commissioner. It's about being as ambitious of so many countries who are saying, here's our timeline for zero carbon. And what's brilliant, we've already talked about this just before lunch, it's about what young students studying economics are doing is saying, no longer is it okay for you to teach us outdated 20th century economics that do not take into account the impact on the planet and that dismiss everything that's not related to profit as an externality. So there's loads happening and I just want to wind up by telling you, and I guess giving you hope, I think, I hope that there is a movement that you can be part of and uh, I guess hopefully amplify the work that you're doing. And this, this is a Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Underneath this bar here, it says knowledge. Because our, our thinking for system change is that if we pull together all the amazing knowledge, that's whether it's in academic journals or whether it's in communities of practice who know what a different sort of economy looks like, if we marry it up with changing the narrative and if we build power bases, we're going to lead to system change. And so narratives have already been spoken about today. And I think that's fantastic because how we communicate these issues really, really matters in terms of people's receptiveness to certain actions. What we've got at the moment is a very, very narrow collective bandwidth. Our cognitive bandwidth has been tightened uh, by what we've been told in our classrooms, in our universities, by advertisers, by the media over the last few decades. Ronald Reagan, I'm quoting all the US presidents, um, Ronald Reagan used to say that there is no limits to growth because there is no limits to our imagination. Well, I'd say the limits to us building a, an economy that's better than growth is our limited imagination. So the narratives that help us open up imaginations are vital. But we need to build power bases. It's not just enough to link together all the amazing good the work that's happening. We need to ensure that these mobilise so in a way that they pack a punch in the current system and change the political conversation in a way that we actually start to create systemic change. And... Part of that is one of the clusters that we all are working with is initiating something called the Wellbeing Economy Governments Partnership. Here we've got the First Minister of Scotland, the Prime Minister of Iceland and Carrie Exton, who's senior representative from the OECD and New Zealand were also in the room, but they didn't send, just send us, so we wanted an all-female panel. And sorry for my dodgy photo. This is me very sneakily trying to take a photo of the First Minister and the Prime Minister under my, <laughs> under my elbow. But essentially what we go is about is trying to work together to
to build a different sort of economic model, to put well-being at the heart of economic policy making in these governments. And it was great because Nicola Sturgeon acknowledged in her speech there that GDP has been too often a measure of a country's success. And she said, yes, there's this growing realisation that growth is not the only measure of success of the economy. We need to give much greater attention to quality of life and we have to test whether we're creating a fairer, healthier, happier nation. And so that's what Wellbeing Economy Government's partnership is to do about, is to do. And we've also set up, we've got this growing proliferation of local hubs, whether it's in Scotland, where we're bringing together people to work across the system and across sectors to mobilise. We've got We All Canada. They get to self call themselves We All Can, which is rather cool. We All Costa Rica, We All New Zealand, all sorts of local places, and hey, maybe even We All Morecambe Bay, if you're up for it, um, just to build that power base at the local level. And then, of course, young people, perhaps inevitably, have come along and said, we want to make real that banner of system change, not climate change, and work with others to change the economic system. And I'm going to offer this to you as something that we've just launched a few weeks ago, and sorry for the bit across the bottom, but it's weallcitizens.org. And this is a platform that you can all use to organise, to mobilise, to connect with people across the world who share a sense that business as usual cannot carry on. And I was saying to Andy earlier on, there is a place you can create closed community groups as well. So if you two, you, you all want to stay together after your final session, maybe We All Citizens is a good place to do that. It's there for you. Uh, it's our offer, our gift to the wellbeing economy movement in the broader sense of the term. And there are now over 90 members who are joining this mission of trying to transform the economy so that it's more humane and more sustainable. And I love the point earlier that we have to have a party when we're doing this. It's got to be fun, and my goodness, we do. But essentially, this is my last slide, this is our theory of change, that if we work together, we can do quite extraordinary things. And my invitation to you is please do feel yourselves part of this movement because we may not have the money of the Koch brothers and others that brought in the current economic system, but we do have the hearts and hands of hundreds and thousands of people around the world who share a sense that we need to transform the economy. And if we work together, Maybe we can ensure that future generations can say what Obama was saying to his interns, that today is the best day to be alive. Thank you so much.